Section 18 of Astounding Stories 20, August 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 20, August 1931, by Captain S. P. Meek. Chapter 18. The Reader's Corner, Part 2. Very pretty problems here. Dear Editor, the letters by P. Schuyler, J. N. Mosler, and Jackson Gee in the last number sure do raise some very neat possibilities in science. Anent travel in time. Just what would you, Mr. Schuyler, expect to see if John Doe at 40 years in 1931 went back to 1892 and met John Doe of that date on Main Street of his old hometown? I suspect that two bodies cannot simultaneously contain the same ego, constant entity, personality, or soul. Which brings me to Mr. Moslet to ask, just how is the self-realizant ego, which is conscious that I am I unchangingly for life, in any sense a derivative of the unstoppable, rapidly changing body? Mr. Burks and Mr. Lee elucidate a very pretty little problem on the same lines. The cranial transplantation and the atomic patterns are admittedly scientifically and reasonably possible, but there is a real point of doubt. Would the personality accompany the brain in transplantation? True, the brain is the control room, but... And would the atomic patterns, perfectly as they could duplicate a body, which is unstable by nature, work on the essential stable ego, relatively? with its inherent capacity for continuity. If not, would not the synthetic extra man be a human being minus personality? Some very pretty problems here. I'd much like to see a story along the lines of item three in Mr. Burke's letter. L. Partridge, Box 84, Cornish, Maine. What price smoothness? Dear Editor, I have just finished the June issue of Astounding Stories. The cover was excellent, as were all the illustrations, except perhaps Manape's arms. Should have been a little larger. I see that the edges of the paper are now smooth, but still, leaves stick out beyond one another, so what good does that do? Manape the Mighty, by Arthur J. Burks, was superb, gripping. I suppose a lot of readers will rise violently against the love interest, but I ask you, just where would this particular story be without the romance in it? This particular story, you understand, not every story. Holocaust by Charles Willard Diffin was next best with The Man from 2071, a close second. The Earthman's Burden was at least entertaining, which this installment of The Exile of Time was not. Robert Baldwin, 359 Hazel Avenue, Highland Park, Illinois. Time Trouble Answers Wanted Dear Editor, I have read your magazine for nearly two years, but this is my first letter to the corner. The first and second installments of Ray Cummings' Exile of Time prompted me to write this. There is a story you can well be proud of. I should like to obtain it in book form. Mr. Cummings is a wonder. I have read many time stories, but this is at the top of my list. If there is any other time fans in A.S.'s Reader's Corner, I should like to have a letter discussion on it with him. None of my acquaintances care a whoop about that type of story, so I have to thrash out all my problems by myself. There are some questions I would like to ask about the exile of time. 1. In the event of the appearance of a time-traveling cage, the story ran, to use Ray's own words, suddenly before me there was a white ghost, a shape, a wraith of something which a moment before had not been there. The shape was like a mist, then in a second or two it was solid. Why should the cage appear as a mist at first? If there is any amount of time separating two things, those two things are invisible to each other, are they not? Any amount of time would include a second, and even a millionth part of a second. In that case, the cage should suddenly appear in the twinkling of an eye, with no trace of a blur. 2. Supposing I were standing at a spot five feet from a time-traveling vehicle. The latter would be traveling through time at 3 p.m. while I am at 2 p.m., an hour's difference between us. It would be invisible to me then, but an hour later, 
when I would be at 3 p.m. and the machine at 4 p.m., then I would see it as it appeared at 3 p.m. Whatever movement it would make in space, I would not see until an hour later. Is that right? Then is it not possible that each individual is existing in a different time realm? And we see them, or I see the other fellow as he appeared when my time caught up with his? I had better quit before I get hooted off the stage. Three. If a man invented a time traveler and went back to the year of the beginning of the World War, knowing all he has read in history, could he not take steps to prevent a war that has already happened? Or would that power be denied him? Somewhere in the story is said that the past cannot be changed, and that any effort to do so would be useless. In my belief, no matter where or when a man goes into the past, if he appears in a year or day that has already gone by, he is changing the past. Then there should be no room for doubt. Time traveling is impossible. It never will be done. An astounding stories fan should be kicked for using the word impossible. Let's have more good thought-provoking time tales, and get lots of stories from Cummings. He's a wow. I sure would like to spend an evening at a campfire with him. Alan Spoolman, 613 4th Avenue, West Ashland, Wisconsin. Eh, what? Dear Editor, Just got my June issue of our good mag Astounding Stories, and I think it is great. One thing you should do, however, is have a more mechanical cover design. In regard to Miss Gertrude Hankin's letter in the June issue of A.S., let me say that I just wonder what she would like to expect in our reader's corner if she does not like to hear what others think of our astounding stories. Maybe she would like to read about checker debates or the like. Eh, what? If Rex Wirtz of Oregon, who is now located somewhere in Los Angeles, will drop me a line, perhaps we can become acquainted as he suggested. Edward Anderson, 123 Hollister Ave, Ocean Park, California. Hope he does. Dear Editor, I have never been interested before in a magazine enough to write to their departments like the Reader's Corner, and I have read plenty of magazines. Beyond the Vanishing Point stands head and shoulders above any story I have ever read. I have only one thing to say about your other stories. They are almost as good as the one I just mentioned. I have a few words to say about these people who throw brickbats at every story they read. I wouldn't be surprised if they just read the story so they could find something wrong with it. There's one in particular who wrote a few lines in the June issue about your taking the word science off the front page, saying there was no science in the magazine anyway. What does the title say? Well, that's what 90% of the readers want, anyway. I hope that chap reads this. Well, I'll sign off. Here is a little toast to the magazine. Long may it live. Earl Rogers, 409, 16th Street, Galveston, Texas. Two better than one? Dear Editor, the two outstanding stories in the May issue of A.S. were The Death Cloud by Nat Schachner and Arthur L. Zagat, and Dark Moon by Charles W. Diffin. Common reasoning tells me that the heads of two science fiction writers can formulate a story better than one. I couldn't help admire Mr. Schachner and Mr. Zagat when I read their story because of the cleverness shown in it. Please give us a story by them every month. Ray Y. Tilford, Rockport, Kentucky. And here I am. Dear Editor, it's about time for me to concede that your, or our, magazine is the best I have read. Ten issues have come into my hands, and I am perfectly well satisfied with the line of fiction that you publish. I have read about fifty different magazines on the market, and I am sure that Astounding Stories is the best of them all. I have followed the magazine for seven months, and that is the best amount of reading any magazine can boast for me. In your case, if the magazine lasts 70 years, you can be sure that I will read it for that period of time, provided I live that long. I notice that several brickbats have come into your hands and that you have printed them. Well, that shows sportsmanship on your part. I would suggest to those who are not satisfied with astounding stories to duck their head in a pail of water and pull it out after a period of 10 minutes. Those who criticize the stories because of the lack of science have no idea what it takes to write a story. Please be willing to concede the author the right of way. He is giving his theories and not yours. However, in some cases where the truth is an established fact, I can see where the readers may present a justified argument. But they should remember that we are not all perfect and that mistakes are made by all. It is not fair to criticize an author by denouncing him. I don't favor reprints at all, 
but I can stay with the majority if they do. It is a foregone conclusion that you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all the time. In this case, substitute the word please in the saying for fool. I am at present reading Charles W. Diffin's novel The Pirate Planet. It is one of the best interplanetary novels that I have ever read. Give us some more of Diffin. He has the goods. I must say that you have an immensely long list of popular authors, and it must cost quite a little amount of money to maintain them. Keep the size of the magazine as it is now, if it fits conveniently into my bookcase, and I believe many of your readers will say the same. Now some of my favorite stories. The Ape Man of Zlati was one of the best stories that I have read in years. Give us some more along this line. It offers rest after one has just finished reading an interplanetary novel. Monsters of Moyen was another story that I greatly enjoyed. Very few people believe that the world shall ever have a conqueror again, and I am one of them. But it is interesting to see if there ever will be a conqueror, and what means he shall employ to get that title. Brigands of the Moon was the worst story I read in your magazine. That must have been Mr. Cummings' off story. But he certainly has come back fine through his later stories. The Tentacles from Below was another great masterpiece. Anthony Gilmore's tale was the first time I have read of that author, and I will be delighted to see more. Funny how I developed into a reader of science fiction. I exhausted all other fields of reading, and having nothing else to read, I delved into a science magazine, and here I am. Michael Riccano, 51 Brookwood Street, East Orange, New Jersey. Turns it to first. Dear Editor, The June issue of Astounding Stories can't be beat. What an issue. As it seems to be the usual thing, I'll start at the front and go to the back. The cover. Very colorful. Another proof of Wesso's talent. And speaking of artists, I was very pleasantly surprised at the unexpected illustration by Paul. I certainly hope you can get him, if not for cover pictures, at least for the inside illustrations. Too bad you are modest about printing complimentary letters, for I mean this to be all roses, no brickbats. The Man from 2071, another good story of John Hansen's. Manape the Mighty, although somewhat like the Tarzan series, is a wonderfully fine story. Holocaust, good. The Earthman's Burden, as of all of Startles, was exceptionally good. The Exile of Time, getting better every issue. The Reader's Corner, as usual, was one of the most interesting parts of the magazine. I always turn to it first, for I know I will have an enjoyable time reading every letter. And by the way, the significance of Manape just came to me. Don't know why I didn't see it before. Linus Hagenmiller, 502 North Washington Street, Farmington, Missouri. Likes the joke. Dear Editor, Although I have read only two issues of Astounding Stories, I feel the urge to write a line. The June number was better than the May issue. Arthur J. Burke's story, Manape the Mighty, was excellent, though I am not so strong for the idea of having Barter escape the apes and carry on his experiments as suggested by the author. It would be against common sense to have the apes allow him to make a getaway. The prize winner in the May issue was Dark Moon. There might be a sequel to that, and I'd like to see it. I like a little variety in a magazine. The readers who say they do not care for stories scientifically impossible may be right. In that case, The Exile of Time is the greatest joke ever written. Yet I like it immensely. One thing that is impossible is the destruction of matter. It can be broken up, or condensed, as in When Caverns Yawned, but not destroyed completely. Mr. W. H. Flowers evidently has a grudge against the fair sex. The love interest is not necessary in short stories, it's true. But what kind of a long novel would it be if the hero had no incentive, nothing to risk his life for except a possible word of praise from the scientific world? No matter how much a man loves his work, it is my opinion that he would not die for the purpose of proving his point. Not being able to take a hint, the knockers still appear to mar an otherwise perfect day, this time in the person of Harry Pancoast. If astounding stories ever get so bad that not even one story in it is of interest to me, I'll just drop out of the waiting line and keep my mouth closed. Richard Waite, 8 South Avenue, Wausau, New York. Never noticed that. Dear Editor, Just bought my latest copy of Astounding Stories, and what an edition. First, the cover. Wesso has all others beat by a mile. Then the stories. Well, take Manape the Mighty. 
it is one of the best science fiction stories i have ever read the exile of time was great have you ever noticed that almost every critic of science fiction is either a teacher or a female jim nicholson and i certainly know that billy roach secretary interplanetary department of the b s b one o one st elmo san francisco california sunflowers for all dear editor miracles do happen i was never so thoroughly astounded in all my life as when i received the great june issue of our magazine with straight edges thank you all concerned for publishing our magazine sans rough edges the smooth edges ought to cut the reading time of astounding stories down to an hour and forty-five minutes as we always used to waste a lot of time fumbling about with the pages but if i was astounded at the long-awaited straight edges I was still more amazed at the great innovation of an illustration by Paul. Let's have more and more of his remarkable drawings. Astounding Stories is truly great, now with its fine editor, splendid authors, excellent stories, worthy illustrations, essential reader's corner, Paul, ah, and good binding. Yes, you heard right, I said good binding. Of course it makes amusing a material to write about the binding, and remark that it comes off after once handling it, or that the paper is soon worn to shreds, but such matters shouldn't be honestly believed. I have every issue of Astounding Stories, eighteen great numbers, and each and every issue is as good as new. I never had any trouble with the covers departing from the rest of the magazine, or the pages becoming moldy. Sewell Peasley writes, the man from 2071 is just perfect. I enjoy nothing more than one of his realistic stories of Commander John Hansen. We want more. Author J. Burke's novelette, Manape the Mighty, was clever. I had a premonition that I wouldn't like the story, and in fact told a friend so. It just goes to prove that hunches can be wrong. Charles Wilfred Diffin should be proud of his Holocaust. I'm sure that most readers enjoyed it as much as I did. Of course, Startle's The Earthman's Burden was a peach. His stories of other planets are always weird, bizarre, and yet they seem to ring true. That is the magic of R. F. Startle. Paul illustrated it in his own unapproachable style. The Exile of Time, as everyone agrees, is Cummings' best. I am waiting for its thrilling conclusion. I am one who would like Astounding Stories to be a large size magazine, but it can easily be seen that everyone can't be pleased. If you'll just leave it the way it is, that is, straight edges, illustrations by Paul, same authors and same excellent editor, I'll be satisfied. Forrest J. Ackerman, 530 Staples Avenue, San Francisco, California. Great relief. Dear Editor, the story Manape the Mighty by author J. Burks was by far one of the most thrilling and educational stories that ever appeared in Astounding Stories. Of course, others will disagree, but an author cannot please all. It is of great relief to change from the monotonous, everyday kind of stories that appear in Collier's, Liberty, and the Saturday Evening Post to the refreshing and soothing, impossible type of Astounding Stories. Ever since the January issue, I have been an ardent pursuer of Astounding Stories, to me it is even more astounding that i seem to like it more and more each succeeding issue i find it undoubtedly the best magazine of its type i've tried others of similar type but it seems as if my mind couldn't grasp the knack of the stories which were either boresome with scientific and technical explanations or as one might say not a darn thing to them r f startle is a wonderful author Ray Cummings, Sewell Peasley Wright, Charles Woolard Diffin, Captain S. P. Meek, Edmund Hamilton, F. V. W. Mason, and Mary Leinster are excellent. There is one thing that I'd like to see in Astounding Stories, and I'm sure many of the readers would too. It is always my habit to read while eating. To finish the story in time, I pick the shortest one. Sad to say, Astounding has rather long stories. How about an occasional short story? I'm sure you readers will approve. That would go over with a bang. P. Nikolaev, 4325 S. Sealy Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Sometimes gets mad. Dear Editor, although I have been an interested reader of Astounding Stories since its inception, 
this is the first time i have written astounding stories has been so good lately that i just had to write and compliment you on your good work there are however some criticisms i have to make the first is i think mr w h flowers of pittsburgh pennsylvania is right when he says you sometimes have too much love in some of your stories the second is i think it would be a good thing to put notes at the end of a page to explain some of the terms for the readers who read mostly for the science part that is what i do and i get mad when i read something that does not give me the inside dope on it outside of that i think astounding stories can't be beat one more thing before i close keep captain s p meek on your staff or i will stop reading astounding stories as much as i would hate to do that i think he is your best author by a long shot wilson adams seat pleasant maryland from a female woman dear editor the comment of jim nicholson in the june issue that it is only the females who consider him cracked for reading science fiction and only women who do not care for science in the stories moves me to break into the reader's corner for the first time i happen to be a quote, female woman unquote, and it is the men in our family and circle of friends who laugh at me for buying every science fiction magazine and book that i can find they call them my nutty magazines i have to admit that i do not understand much of the scientific explanation since my mind does not run along mathematical or scientific lines but i do not mind having that in stories for those who do care for it and can understand it as i can simply skip over it taking what i can grasp and letting the rest go it doesn't spoil the story for me i have no criticism constructive or otherwise to make i enjoy the stories with the romance involved and enjoy those without equally well my own preference would be that you continue using rough paper and your present mechanical construction so that more money will be available to pay for the stories few of us keep the magazines anyway so there isn't so much need for expensive paper i like interplanetary stories best i think but i was intensely interested in beyond the vanishing point man ape the mighty and holocaust all different but all very good I can't remember one I did not like. My work requires much study and concentration. I have recommended to several men who do similar mental work that they follow my plan of securing delightful relaxation by losing themselves in another world through science fiction magazines. Most of them find it as restful as I do. Bernice M. Harrison, Angola, Indiana. Likes R.F. Startzel. Dear Editor, it has been my purpose to write to you before, but due to an extraordinary amount of detail work which I have had to do, I have been unable to. I have read your marvelous magazine ever since the first issue came into my hands, and I can honestly say that there is no other book on the market which has held my attention as long as yours has. I congratulate you on your very interesting magazine. Arthur J. Burks, in his latest story, has conceived an entirely new type of story, and I, for one, think it is very interesting. Plenty of science for the layman, and enough interest for the others. I liked R. F. Startzel's story, The Earthman's Burden, very much, and I hope you will have more by this author soon. His stories are perfect. Startzel is a deep thinker, and I am right here to say that there is a man who understands men, and men's longings and inhibitions. E. W. Gowing, 17 Pasadena Street, Springfield, Mass. The Reader's Corner. All readers are extended a sincere and cordial invitation to come over in the Reader's Corner and join in our monthly discussion of stories, authors, scientific principles and possibilities, everything that's of common interest in connection with our astounding stories although from time to time the editor may make a comment or so this is a department primarily for readers and we want you to make full use of it likes dislikes criticisms explanations roses brickbats suggestions everything's welcome here so come over in the readers corner and discuss it with all of us 
the editor. End of section 18